This is episode 27 of the Immunology Podcast, AAI 2022, building on the past to meet the moment with Dr. Gary Koretsky. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rapp. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have a great episode with Dr. Gary Koretsky, president of the American Association of Immunologists. We're going to be talking about the Society's meeting, Immunology 2022. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology coming up. But first... Performing multiple rounds of cell isolations can be tiresome and inefficient. Using the new EC250 ECSEP magnet, you can scale up your cell isolation and process large volume samples like leukopax and whole blood in one single round of separation. Obtain highly purified cells from samples up to 225 mils in a single step. Learn more at www.stemcell.com forward slash EC250 magnet. Oh, Brenda, do you have any large volume preps to do here soon? Mm-hmm. Uh, I already did my Buffy Coach of the Month, so <laughs> too late. It's too late, Stem Cell. Uh, I know there are sponsors, but... I do the old, good old fecal, I have to say. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a classic you, you, uh, you lover. Can, you can see the layer in between when you spin it? Oh, can, yeah. I, I like that, that. That's a must. I need to see that layer. I mean, there is something, and I have to say there's something therapeutic about pouring a fecal layer, you know, just like slowly, you know. I have really good pulse, so I find that very satisfying. I have really nice layers. See, I, I did it one time with like two mils of mouse blood when I was trying to isolate IELs and couldn't see diddly. And there was no layer. I'm very, well, I mean, you you don't have the best starting material uh, for, for doing that. No, no, I did not. Better go for an inflamed colon. You get tons of cells from those ones. I definitely do that. Anyway, so let's see here. It's been a year, Brenda. Happy anniversary, Jason. It's been okay. such a fun time with you. The anniversary as well. I can't believe we've finally gotten to get a whole year through. And what a year yeah. it's been. It feels like a lifetime. Yeah, well, it's at least it's at least four Greek alphabet letters in the past. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, yeah. though, it's it's been a blast. Yeah, we have meetings coming up here. We are going to be uh, hitting up AAI, which should be great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Stem so present. Yep, with some extra special episodes coming to everyone here. And I don't know, I don't know about you, I just got back from Disney World and Experimental Biology all in 10 days. Whoa, what's Experimental Biology done at Disney World? That's that's rad. No, sadly, no, it was done in Philadelphia. Oh. But I oh. came back from exper- uh, from Disney World and then just went downtown Experimental Biology. Now, should a conference be done at Disney World? Yes. That'd be amazing. They have a big conference center there. But I don't know. Oh, they do. They do. It's like a thing. Nice. Can you be can you be introduced? Can the chair of the session be Mickey Mouse in that case? That would be amazing. Like you have a bloopers reel by Goofy. I mean, you never know. Maybe one of those Disney characters actually wanted to be a scientist, but had to, you know, settle for acting because then he needed to feed, you know, his wife and two children. You never know. Yeah. Especially with postdoc pay these days, right, Brenda? Yeah. <laughs> Industry guy. You know what? Just bring me your face paper. Let's not get down there and just, just talk about the science. All right. All right. I could help myself. Well, well, we'll do COVID quickly because then we can be done with it maybe for the day. Unless you have another COVID yeah. hit. Said everyone all the time. Uh, <laughs> right. We're never going to be done yeah. with it. Sorry. I had to say it. Hey, hey, this Come has on. all four variants in it. We got Alpha, Beta, Delta, and um, Omicron. Finally, I mean, a lot of these latest papers are uh, kind of surprising because Omicron is not there, and it's like, well, you guys, this is so 2021 what you're doing right now. Uh, th- this this is definitely 2022. All right, so this paper right. is circular RNA vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 and emerging variants in cell. First author is Liang Ku. Last author is Wang Sheng Wei. It is it was accepted the 30th of March. It's still and pre-proof so it doesn't get much more hot off the press than this right cell press there you go cell press pun all right folks um so what they look at is some flaws in current rna vaccine technology and what they can do to fix them essentially um so rna technology right for all these mrna vaccines the biggest problem is it degrades really easy from exonucleases 
because it's linear RNA and your body wants to kill it dead and the environment wants to kill it dead. It does not like RNA running around for lots of good reasons. But that makes making vaccines harder because you have to have cold chain often and all these storage conditions. It's very difficult, right? Um, that's why, for instance, J&J's adenoviral vector, which has its own issues, but that has more stability, can be room temp because the virus protects it, unlike the lipid layer, which just does not grant as much protection. So they use circular RNA. Circular RNA is much more resistant to exonucleases, at least in theory. And this paper shows that, hey, if we make a circular form of the vaccine, you know, with the, MA, with the re uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein, it does indeed not get nicked. So that's the first thing they show that. But then they take this a lot further. So they add a TPA, tissue plasminogen activator domain on to make sure it gets exported very well. And they add an oligomerization domain to try to get trimers of the receptor binding domain because they found that in reality, trimers are often formed of the spike protein and you get better antigenicity to it if you can get a trimer to form. So they do this, they make these modified versions. And then they do mouse studies, they do monkey studies, they take human serum, they use pseudovirus, they use regular virus, and they make variants of the vaccine for alpha, beta, Omicron, and Delta variants. And they show A, the circular vaccine gives you higher titers, more durable response. So the vaccine is more stable. You get higher titers of every variant. And then they actually compare the effect of vaccination on you neutralizing antibody function of each variant vaccine against each variant. So how well does the Omicron variant vaccine do against Omicron so on and so forth? Not surprisingly, if you make an Omicron variant, it works pretty well against Omicron, but it works terribly against everything else. But if you make a Delta variant, it works against all of them. And so they found that the lead candidate is really the Delta um, sequence, with those variations, works well against all of the variants that we know about so far of concern, including the Omicron variant. And while there is a hit in the neutralizing antibody production, it still works really pretty dang well. And they also showed that that third booster that we've been seeing really does have an additive effect, and it's pretty significant. And yeah, there you go. So... Oh, well, sorry. And also the Omicron worked against alpha and beta, but doesn't work against the native one or delta. So the only one that hits everything is the delta variant. And they do this. They vaccinate monkeys. They do cell work. They show protection all over the place and have a pretty good technology. Now it's just a matter of doing a whole other clinical trial. Yeah, that's my, what's going to be my question. So this data is from macaques, was it? Yep. And are they planning on testing it in humans? I don't or? think they disclosed that. Mm. Right. I mean, it looks very interesting. So when it comes to stability and, and, and handling of this vaccine, uh, what are the what is the situation? Room temp, or you can heat it up. It doesn't degrade. Okay, I do. I'm a very. I find very interesting the 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 fact that the Delta sequence is the most protective. I guess they probably discussed the mutations because there's a bunch of different kind of immune escape mutations between the different variants. Is that they like, don't does do Delta a have... whole bunch of comparison at like a biochemical level? And Omicron has some mutations just like Beta which actually drops out on testing on the S spike. It's one of the things that's how you detect it. Delta doesn't have this, but Omicron and Beta do. Um, but mm. apparently that single mutation screws up everyone's ability to sequence um, for like, especially like Thermo Fisher tests or other ones that look at this S, S gene for PCR testing to see if you have COVID. Um, that's not that important for immunogenicity. So they don't explain why the Delta variant mm. is best for you know, gives Omicron protection, but the Omicron doesn't give Delta. Presumably it's just the package of mutations they have. I also think that their their trimeric oligomerization strategy may have something to do with it, right? Because mm. even if you have mutations, if some of those mutations are affecting the ability to oligomerize or something else, they may not be exposed to the antibody. They may be, you know, protein, protein on, yeah. on the oligomer. And so maybe that's what's causing the difference. No, they don't go into the biochemistry of this, but at a certain point, clinically, if it works, it works. Yeah. It is still, I mean, this, we still don't know about, because they are looking at neutralizing antibody assays. 
yeah. for, for measuring this. They're not looking at they didn't do this. They didn't do T cell responses T -cell. a bunch. Well, they did do some T cell responses against um, in both mice and rhesus monkeys. Um, multiple mm -hmm. figures show inter I believe interferon production and other things. So they did. They did All do right. that work too with the cells. They don't right. go into like complete killing assays and all this other stuff, but they do go into um, um, basic studies and show that you have different levels of cytokine production. Okay. Well, I wonder if at some point we're going to start changing the sequences that we use. Might They're already doing it. Moderna is. They're getting Moderna, ready. but is it is it already in the market? No, no. They have to do some small trial or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. Enough of COVID. Is that the, your only COVID paper? It is. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, let's just then pretend, go back to pretending COVID doesn't exist because I mean, I don't know about you, but here in, in the Netherlands, it's all gone. No, there are other more pressing matters in the news and you know, I don't know, people just, just go around without a mask, without anything. Clearly the battle has been won. Uh, sarcasm off. Um, so I'm going to talk about a paper that relates in a way to a previous story I, I shared, was it last episode? Uh, about B cells and, and multiple sclerosis and talking about, well, autoimmunity in the brain and the CNS. And um, so re remember that one of the, so we discussed about the, it looks like B cells are having, one of the papers discussed the importance of B cells uh, in mediating or initiating uh, uh, a mouse MS in, in, in their models. And the fact that, so they, one of the facts that is often pointed out is that um, depletion of presumably B cells using anti-CD20 antibodies is uh, highly therapeutic against MS. And people often assume that this is because you're depleting uh, B cells, because who else is expressing CD20? And this paper is actually really cool at looking into who else uh, answering this question and focusing on on the on the reply, which is actually there are CD20 positive T cells that are um, ha more expressed or more um, represented in the context of uh, autoimmunity and particularly in, in multiple sclerosis. So this is a paper uh, from um, on science translation and medicine, first author Yasmin Ox from the lab of Martin Weber at the University of Göttingen, and it's titled Pro-Inflammatory CD20 Positive T-Cells Contribute to CNS-Directed Autoimmunity. So they they start uh, picking up, the, as I mentioned, the fact that there, are, they, there have been identified cells that stain. So if you stain them for CD20, there's a population of cells that are expressing CD20 or they have CD20 on their surface. And um, they are more frequently found in autoimmune disorders, such as multiple sclerosis. And that, um, that they're, they're frequently increases in this, in this condition. So there's always this idea, are they involved? What are they doing? Where do they come from? And um, so they, they start looking closer into this and they identify, they use, start with mouse, uh, cells, and they identify that they, if they are uh, having cells, no, they have model, mouse models of multiple sclerosis, and that they kind of find indeed, uh, they identify the CD20 positive T cells. Uh, they are present in cells from the spleen and splenocytes from the mouse, um, and they show that in mouse that are deficient in B cells, they don't find these these uh, CD20 positive T cells. Moreover, mouse T cells don't express the transcript, so they're clearly not making it themselves. And they show that when you activate splenocytes, uh, particularly if you use uh, peptides or you activate it specifically with, with peptides, in this case, they have uh, mice, uh, two, two D2 mice that are recognizing an uh, epitope from uh, an oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, uh, also known as MOG, that activates these T cells. And they show that their expression of the, uh, the presence of CD20 on the surface of these T cells is depending on the, uh, is related to the amount of antigen they put in the splenocytes mix and then and activate the cells. Um, 
they uh, see that this this, this uh, C20 expression of T cells only happens if the cells are in close contact with B cells. If they put them, separate them through a trans well, you don't see that. They don't, they don't get CD20. Uh, and, and so what, basically what they, what they show is that these T cells are basically nibbling uh, CD20 from the membrane of the B cells they're in contact with through uh, at the moment of antigen presentation. Uh, so they're basically through uh, trogocytosis. They are acquiring whole pieces of membrane of the B cells, and with that membrane comes CD20. And um, what, they, what is interesting is that, so this, this is also mediated by MHC class 2 expression on B cells, so they have to be presenting antigen to the T cells. So they focus on CD4 cells at this stage, and... Um, that it, this is depending on the amount of antigen that has been loaded on the system. CD20 state has a turnaround of around two days, so uh, this, this presence of CD20 on the surface of T cells uh, is a, seems to be a reflection of recent activation antigen presentation by B cells to this to these T cells. And so they also go into an in vivo situation, and again, mice that are deficient in B cells don't have under any circumstances they can find the CD20 positive T cells. Um, and so the question is, what is up with these cells? What are, are these cells special? So they're uh, presenting CD, uh, CD20, anything else? And they show that these T cells also, uh, when they isolate CD20 positive T cells from the draining lymph nodes, uh, up after immunization with MOG in uh, 2D2 mice, they show that these cells have higher activation markers and particularly more adhesion molecules that would um, kind of also affect their, their, their uh, distribution later on. It's going to be relevant. They have a higher frequency of uh, interferon gamma expression, GMCSF. And so these are kind of more pro-inflammatory cells than uh, the CD20 negative cells. And if you, act, if you transfer... Also, if you can uh, initiate a kind of an AAE uh, uh, NMS model in mice by transferring activated CD20 positive T cells, and they will, uh, so they will, they will um, really, what's the word, um, infiltrate the CNS of this mice. And so they come to the, when they look into human subjects, they also see that human cells also can uh, acquire CD20 by co culturing with B cells. Um, and they also seem to be more active. The CD20 positive cells have more activation markers than the CD20 negative cells in these cultures. And that MHC uh, class 2 blockade prevents this transfer of CD20 to T cells. And when it comes to the, the relevance of this uh, CD20 population, uh, again, they show that they're more pro inflammatory and they suggest that part that these cells represent a particularly pathogenic type of T cell present in the CNS of patients with, with MS. So these, uh, the expression of CD20 by this kind of particularly pathogenic subset of T cells seems to be kind of the depletion of these cells by an anti-CD20 antibody, the authors argue, would also uh, act through the depletion of this pathogenic T cell subset. Uh, or, and also you can consider CD20 positive T cells as a biomarker for inflammation and uh, in the case of, of for following or for uh, scoring patients with MS or with other auto-inflammatory uh, diseases. So I thought it was really cool uh, that they kind of looked into this little population and I thought it was fun, the fact that these T cells are stealing CD20 from the B cells they interact with, uh, very sneaky. Uh, so that was, was pretty nice, nice, nice paper. So is the idea then, it's not necessarily that the CD20 is doing something. It's a real population of CD20 positive T cells. It's that bad acting T cells will nibble up CD20 from B cells. And those same bad actors are doing, as I said, bad things in MS. And then also similarly, if you deplete CD20, you're going to get rid of these bad acting T cells because they got greedy, ate all the CD20 from the B cells, and thus they're going to get caught by the same drug. That... Yeah, yeah, that is the point, because we don't really know what is the function if CD20 has a function. It doesn't have a signaling domain, so it's not clear what CD20 is doing, but it's present. So CD20 is more like a, like, um, what's the word, uh, a telltale of T 
T cells are got really greedy and really activated by these B cells. And therefore, they, be, they went bad. And CD20 is there to, sh to kind of prove it in a way. Hmm. Interesting. That's very interesting. So I think just one thing. I think this kind of nicely kind of couples to the story about B cells and the function of like what are B cells doing in MS? Maybe they're actually also priming these, these T cells that wouldn't exist uh, without the B cells. So maybe that's also partly why B cells are in, involved in MS, uh, in MS pathogenicity, because they are clearly activating these T cells very strongly. And you see it because they, they nibble out some of the membrane from the B cells to show it. Maybe. All right. Well, I don't have a good segue to the next one because we're just going all the way to neutrophils. And I know how you feel about innate cells. Um, uh, well, neutrophils are also quite bad, quite bad actors sometimes. So let's see what case. they're doing right now. So this says neutrophils oh. direct pre-existing matrix to initiate repair in damaged tissues. Our first author is Adrian Fisher. Last author is Yuval Rinkovic. It is in Nature Immunology, published the 30th of March of this year. So this is a really cool paper. They use a dye. Um, it's a um, NHS, which is anhydroxysuccinamide ester fluorescein dye. And you can, it doesn't kill cells, but you can use it to dye the surface of a tissue. And so they dye different parts of different tissues, peritoneum, liver, um, cecum, right? To study different intestinal, you know, abdominal injury and adhesions that can happen post-surgery. And then sh when they dye it, they show that after, if they dye different spots, they show that after an injury that they induce, the different spots, the dye, they merge in space. And then they can use um, harmonic resonance to look at underlying structure as well and show that essentially the dyed tissue that you stained is moving into the wound. So that's the first step. And they go, huh, that's interesting. And there's these filaments that transfer and they, they kind of, do this in several injuries, a laparotomy model, injury to the liver, intestinal adhesion. And so they're showing that there is marking the surface, the surface matrix moves into an injury. All right, well, that's interesting to start with. Then they show that there's nothing de novo being synthesized. They use these, they feed and they, well, they inject um, non-canonical amino acids that you can figure, you can detect very easy with clicket chemistry. And nothing is showing up. The, the, the extracellular matrix that they're seeing move at one day and 72 hours, and it's not synthesized. So whatever's going is a movement. And they, they find a lot of PDGF positive cells and other things that are all important. Collagen types, they look at genetics and show that the cells involved, because there's, there's scar forming wounds and not, and so the wounds that don't generally form scars don't have the genes in those milieus that would expect to form scars that all makes sense right nothing surprising there but very consistent but they show that it's actually transferred matrix extracellular matrix and that it is what is required for um regeneration and so they then they model the distance that it can work and so it's very, it has to be very proximal. So if you do things on ra very different sides of the tissue, it won't work. But if you do like a peritoneal on one side and cecal next to each other where you'd get an adhesion, you do see transfer of the extracellular matrix between those two. So it's about spatial proximity. I haven't even gotten to the neutrophils yet. So they really, they really map out wound healing here. Then they go... Um, the type of transferred matrix matters for the type of wound healing. So they look at the genes and the different matrices and proteins involved. And again, there's non-scar forming and scar forming. And the matrix underlying it predicts which you'll get, right? And, the, and there's different matrices transferred under those different conditions. Then, and this is where it gets into immunology land. So they, they show it's mesothelial mesothelium in origin 
um, in terms of where the matrix comes from by tagging. Um, so they, they tag, they, they use an interesting genetic marker where um, there is an M cherry in the collagen gene. And so when you synthesize collagen, then it has M cherry in it and show that that is indeed where the tissue is coming from, is from cells that specifically have that gene, in this case, mesothelial origin cells. So nothing weird there. But then they show that neutrophils move it. So now they, they look at other cells, they see neutrophils swarm these wounds, which is a known thing they do. And then they show that neutrophils are responsible for doing this. They ablate neutrophils, the effect goes away. And they do that, um, so they do, you know, some lies, lies 2 Cree mice that have markers so you can watch the neutrophils. They deplete them with neutrophil, you know, anti-neutrophil antibodies, show the effect goes away. Um, they, you know, look at other markers and make sure they're really neutrophils and not some other, you know, myeloid cell. Um, they inhibitor aminopeptidase, caspasin, metalloproteases. Nothing affects that um, ability to swarm. But um, if you do elastase inhibitors, that does affect ability for to swarm. And then they go even deeper and they go into integrins. And they find that, you know, so one chemokine blockade for neutrophils prevents the effect. And then they find that that's integrin and they deep dive further using some single cell RNA-seq because of course it's a good paper. So now you have single cell RNA-seq and uh, they do into, they look at and they find that's integrin MB2 is responsible and it is what gets the neutrophil to bind to the extracellular matrix and drag it. And so if you blockade that integrin specifically or do a knockout, you lose the effect. And so they show that it's truly a specific integrin that orchestrates the movement by neutrophils of extracellular matrix into wounds to enable healing. It's not synthesis. It's literally dragging it. And it's done through this one specific component of the integrins called Kindle. Kindle in three is important. And the show if you knock that out, the whole thing goes away. And, oh, and then, the, and then they show that this is heat shock protein factor dependent. So heat shock signaling is important generally in fibrosis processes. They show that if you knock this out, you don't get the extra, you don't get the signaling cascade that leads to the integrin uh, complex forming. So heat shock proteins required for the integrin complex to form in neutrophils to take the extracellular matrix and drag it to a wound. So they're like taking bricks from one house and putting them in another house that just got blown up Yeah, or something. Then you can go build, put the few bricks back where you need it later. Kind of nice. So they are really. Why? Why would they do that and not just synthesis? Takes yeah, is longer. it easier? Yeah, I guess it is easier to just take for somewhere else than wait for the cells to synthesize well, it by itself. Right. Well, then you have the extracellular matrix there. Then other cells can can bind onto it, and then you have the the network needed to rebuild the tissue. Right. If you don't have an extracellular matrix, how does this? How do the cells know how to organize themselves on to make regrow the tissue? Yeah. It'd have to be edge to edge, edge to edge margin all over the place. You have no. Yeah, connection. that makes sense. You have no scar to protect, prevent tissue loss. You have no structural integrity as you're healing. So you put down a matrix and then you heal it. Yeah, but those those lazy neutrophils, they don't make the matrix themselves. They steal it from somewhere else. They drag it. They repurpose it. But um, I, what I didn't understand is, is there a preference from one tissue to another? Did you say it? That... If you have a lesion in some particular place, is there a preferential source of these extracellular matrix, or do they just how do they choose where they get it from? Nearby. Okay, whatever is close by. Okay, well, it makes sense. Yep. Very interesting. Look at those sneaky little workers. I always, I mean, when I think of neutrophils, I think of like you know nets and just. Having Cassie cells killing bacteria or something, but I guess they they also do things for peace. Good for them. Um, well, I'm gonna say, in, seeing that you talked about injuries, I will also move on into 
uh, injuries, but uh, in the context of neuropathic pain. So this paper from um, published on in Science from first authors Kita Kono and Ryoji Shirasaka from the lab of Makoto Tsuda at Kyushu University in Japan. First paper from Japan I discuss, I think. Um, a spinal microglia or microglia population involved in remitting and relapsing neutro, uh, neuropathic pain. So in this case, they are also looking into a model of, of um, injury to the upon damage to the nervous system often results in the development of neuropathic pain, which is a kind of a pain of uh, that is of non not is not originated in kind of the the, the sensory and the, on the extremities of your uh, of your uh, say what's the word of your nervous system but it's more uh, centralized and how the how do you recover from this pain and how uh, you manage to to recover after this injury the pain doesn't last forever thankfully but it is some some way uh, attenuated and they're looking closer into the mechanisms by which this is achieved and the particularly the cells that are involved in this so they have um a model uh, of what they call peripheral nerve injury, uh, that in which they they damage the spinal dorsal uh, dorsal horn, and then you they have microglia in that area that responds to this damage, um, and they want to look close into what are the characteristics of this microglia uh, in particular. So they for this they they focus on one particular type that is uh, microglia expressing uh, CD11C, also known as ITGAX, which is an integrin. And that has been shown to increase uh, in, the, in, in certain neurological disease models, where there's inflammation um, and a mechanical, a mechanical damage. So, and they have this, actually this group has uh, a lot of several papers on this, on this topic. And so they have this, this ITGAX venous mice in which they express a fluorescent protein uh, under the ITGAX uh, promoter, and which allows them to re-identify these cells. And they, they, when they look at co-expression with markers of microglia, they can identify uh, CD11C expressing microglia in the, in the CNS. So when they, again, they characterize what happens after uh, after a PNI, peripheral nerve injury, they see that indeed there is an increase increase of microglia cells uh, in the, around the set of injury. Uh, but then they have the different these populations have different kinetics, and in the case of the CD11C positive population, they actually peak a little bit later than other microglia around day 14, and that's where the pain. Is, so they, they do measure kind of the pain response from the mice. That's when the mice are feeling the, 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 the worst. They have the highest pain index around day 14. And then they, they stay in, 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 the, in the CNS for until the end of the experiment. So day 56, the, the cells are still there in the, around the site of injury. And um, so when they look, they, what they see is that if they deplete it gags positive cells by using a uh, model which you have it gags and a diphtheria, a diphtheria toxin receptor. They, if they treat the mice uh, from the from day fourteen when they have the highest pain, and they deplete CD eleven C positive cells, the mice don't don't uh, recuperate from this pain hypersensitivity. Uh, they measure the pain with what they call this pull withdrawal threshold, in which. Uh, they, the mice respond to mechanical stimuli and then they, they retract their paw, they, they retract away from the pain. So they show that uh, by depleting uh, CD11C positive cells, these, these mice did not recover. And then, so basically these, these cells are, are, are doing, uh, they're, they're having some function in reducing and in curing or, or recuperating from, from the pain. So they see that the cells uh, have a high expression, particularly compared with CD11C negative cells, of insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, and that this factor is the, the production and secretion of this factor by these CD11C positive um, micro microglia cells 
is kind of key uh, from the recovery uh, from this of this mice. So if they knock out uh, IGF one uh, in IDGAX positive cells, if they uh, inhibit, if they neutralize this uh, cytokine with antibodies. Uh, they will reduce the recovery of the mice and and they can actually accelerate the recovery if they administer IGF-1 uh, to uh, them directly. So it really shows that the cells are producing IGF-1, which reduces the pain. And what is very important, I think what's very interesting is that this is even the case after 35 days, which in which all mice... Um, kind of normal mice recover. So you have the most pain at day 14 and then they start slowly recovering and around day 35, all mice are kind of back to normal. But if you deplete CD11 C positive cells at this point, or you prevent the function of IFGF1, you have the pain comes back and they show that uh, this CD11 C, where do these CD11 C positive cells come from? They actually developed the microglia cells start uh, expressing CD11 C when they are um, so when they are exposed to myelin debris, um, and this is would be a response to they see mechanical damage and myelin, and they take this the uptake of this myelin results in cells expressing CD11C. So it's very interesting uh, because they also so, now this is a way of also can have some uh, implications to to patients feeling pain. Uh, maybe this population is also important for for human uh, pain, uh, yeah, and, and kind of neuropathic pain. And I think it was very interesting that these cells, they don't fix the problem, but they prevent the feeling of pain. Um, and they kind of patch it up. Uh, and this is, what, this is what they see. So it sounds like though the missing link is showing that in humans, chronic pain is somehow related to a lack of these cells, right? That's, they haven't gotten there I guess, yet. yeah. How would you do that though? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's microglia really looking... cells. You don't want to go poking in someone's brain. Yeah. Or yeah. do you? Oh. Meh. Meh. I don't know. Maybe you can can induce the the the, the generation of these cells. Uh, in some way, I mean, they do in 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 vitro. I think it's in vitro in this paper. They actually by if they uh, inject here, yeah, they do if they do intraspinal injection of myelin debris. Uh, the cells. So they got they got this. It, um, this 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 uh, microglia take up the debris and they start expressing C11C as a, as a result. All right. Well, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Gary Kritsky, the president of the American Association of Immunologists, in just a moment. But before we get to that, whether you're looking to attend an immunology conference this year or to expand your network, make the most of your experience by downloading our collection of tools to help you prepare for your next event. Stem Cell Technologies' downloadable checklists and guides include recommendations on how to get ready before attending conferences, tips for networking, best practices for your LinkedIn profile, and more. Download the conference toolkit at www.stemcell.com slash conference hyphen toolkit. Hi, everyone. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Gary Koretsky. Uh, he is Vice Provost for Academic Integration, Professor of Medicine at the Cornell uh, University, and where he's also Director for the Cornell Center for Immunology. And currently, uh, Dr. Kresky is President of the American Association of Immunologists. So we're very excited to be talking to him today. Thank you for joining. Well, well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being here. Dr. Kresky, um, we're very excited to talk to you about many topics today. Uh, we will go soon into uh, AAI and the upcoming Immunology 2022 meeting, which is uh, very much looked forward. But I would like to start asking you a little bit about your life scientific, uh, so to say, and just maybe talk to us and our audience about your experience as an immunologist and your current work at Cornell University. Sure. Well, well, well. Thank you so much for asking. Um, uh, you know, when I think about myself as an immunologist, um, I, I actually must say I've had um, the luckiest career that one could imagine. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about how I became an immunologist. Um, I was an MD-PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. 
I thought I was going to do my PhD in neurosciences, but I took the medical school introductory class to uh, in immunology and was just blown away. It was uh, at this amazing time in immunology. Uh, people were just beginning to um, approach uh, the science of identifying the T-cell antigen receptor. We knew a lot of descriptive immunology um, and molecular approaches and techniques were really just beginning to be applied to the field. And I I'd actually, as an undergraduate, never studied immunology. And the notion of trying to um, decipher how the body was able to identify pathogens, to be able to identify things that were foreign, and then respond appropriately, but not over respond, uh, was just incredibly intriguing. Um, so I did my PhD in immunology. And like I said, this was at this amazing time where molecular approaches were being applied to the field. And what I was interested in first as a graduate student, was some of the basic descriptive events that occurred when T cells proliferated. Um, I worked in a laboratory of Peter Knoll, who was an amazing mentor and amazing scientist, um, who gave me a lot of freedom to think about um, the experiments that I wanted to do. I then left uh, Penn and I did my uh, residency and uh, fellowship in rheumatology and went back to the laboratory uh, this time in the lab of Art Weiss um, at the University of California, San Francisco. And I discovered that in the three or four years where I had finished medical school and did residency, the field had just blossomed. And this was a time when there was this amazingly fundamental question that was just beginning to be approached. And that was the T cell receptor was cloned, it was known, the structure had been identified. And then the question was, how did engagement of that receptor result in cellular activation? In other words, how did the cells know that the receptor was engaged, this whole concept of signal transduction? And what was the most fun for me was uh, coming into this field really at its beginning, uh, where molecular approaches were being applied at the very beginning, uh, we read a lot about the insulin receptor, the PDGF receptor, other receptor systems to try to understand where some of the lessons learned in those systems could be applied to immunoreceptors. And then the field really blossomed to the point where studies in immunology were beginning to inform others who were studying signal transduction in their own systems. And this was the late 1980s, beginning 1990s, where um, three or four times a year, there would be a meeting, a FACIP conference, an AAI meeting, a Keystone meeting. And at that meeting, there would be an observation described that just knocked people's socks off. It just really changed paradigms. And, and I'll just tell you a few of those. And this is, of course, not my work only, but I was really, really fortunate to be able to participate at this time. But for example, we learned that, um, and we now, of course, is the larger scientific community, that um, when the T cell receptor is engaged, one activates protein tyrosine kinases. But the T cell receptor is not a tyrosine kinase. So how did that happen? And that led to the discovery of the immunoreceptor tyrosine based activation motifs, the ITAMs, uh, in the cytoplasmic domains of the CD3 molecules. It was then learned that these ITAMs themselves were phosphorylated, and then there was the recruitment of protein tyrosine kinases. So unlike the platelet-derived growth factor receptor or the insulin receptor, which is a tyrosine kinase, the T-cell receptor, which had, or the T-cell receptor in CD3 complex, which had no intrinsic en enzymatic activity, became a tyrosine kinase after engagement. So, so what were those kinases they were uh, identified and how did they get recruited? And these were the, some of the fundamental questions. And then the other types of questions that were really, again, a lot of fun is that molecules would be identified, hypotheses would be generated, experiments would be done. And sometimes the hypothesis was completely wrong. I'll give you an example. 
Um, early on in immunology, um, investigators described the CD45 molecules. There's CD45.1, CD45.2. These were molecules that were really useful for immunologists because you could uh, transplant cells. You could um, uh, transfer cells from one mouse to another, um, and they would differ in their CD45 alleles. Um, so you could tell the transferred cells apart from uh, the host cells. And so those um, uh, the CD45 was used by immunologists for a long period of time, but there was no clear function of the molecule. So uh, the story goes that I think it was in 1989, the first protein tyrosine phosphatase was cloned. That was a molecule that was identified uh, from human placenta. Um, GenBank existed at the time. So the sequence was put into GenBank. And the only molecule with homology was CD45. So here is a molecule that was studied for years by immunologists, and now it had an enzymatic function. It was a protein tyrosine phosphatase. So of course, what's the hypothesis, right? You stimulate T cells, you activate protein tyrosine kinases. Um, T cells have CD45, a protein tyrosine phosphatase. So of course, the prediction was that that turned off cellular activation. And what were the experiments? Well, the experiments were to make knockout mice. The experiments were to make cell lines without CD45 with the anticipation that they would be hyperactive. And the result was exactly the opposite. They were completely unable to be stimulated through their receptor. So this led to the notion that tyrosine phosphatases could both be inactivating, but also activating. And in fact, CD45 is activating because it regulates a negative regulatory tyrosine on the protein tyrosine kinases of the SARC family. So it was these sorts of observations that completely shifted how we thought about how signaling could occur. And I'll just give you one other example that um, our laboratory was really interested in adapter molecules. Uh, we identified one that we named SLIP76. Again, we thought it would be a rheostat. It might regulate signaling to some extent. It and then its cousin, uh, um, linker of activated T cells or LAT, later on um, identified and then, and then, um, and then studied by, by knockouts. These molecules were absolutely essential in order for um, lymphocytes to become activated. In fact, without LAD or without 76, there are no T cells at all in the mouse. Um, and so what this again was another example where observations that were made that really were paradigm shifting extended beyond immunology and taught us an awful lot about fundamental science. How exciting. I know Jason has a question, but I just need to say, I use so many times CD45.1, CD45.2 mice, and I never knew they were used before we actually even knew what CD45 was doing. Fascinating. So I was just wondering before we kind of move on to some of your more recent work at Cornell and then AAI, without going too much in depth, because I think it'll take, you could answer this for a while. What was it like working in a field at the time where every three months there was a paradigm shift. It seems head spinning to me. Yeah. Yes, I'd say exhausting. <laughs> it was, but really, really exhilarating. I mean, this is, um, was, uh, and, and this happens in fields, right? That there are breakthroughs and then there's just so much new that can be done. Um, and it's just like, I, I would just say an enormous privilege to be in a field at that time. A lot of luck, right, to end up, but also to uh, work with colleagues who are really, really excited about what they did. And one of the nice things about this also, it was a collegial field. People knew each other, they liked each other, they interacted, and um, it was really, I think, uh, at, at a time when there was this incredible thirst to try to figure out the next step and then the next step and then to put the pieces together. And of course, we don't know everything of yet, right? That a lot of this is really yet to be explored and understood, but it was this 
period of discovery that was just so much fun. Moving on a little bit, as Jason mentioned, to your current position at Cornell and also um, some recent work that you have done uh, related to COVID and the response that Cornell University had against COVID. Um, can you maybe share with us your experience as head of uh, of such an important institution and what the work that you've done? And I think you we discussed before that you're very proud of Cornell's response during the COVID outbreak. Sure. So I'll, I'll maybe break this up into two parts. Um, so for my own career, um, um, I, you know, had a laboratory where we um, were, you know, with trainees and, 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 and doing the sort of work that I was describing. Um, but the next thing that I felt would be really important would be to try to help the next generation uh, do their science, right? So I took on different roles where I uh, uh, played a role in developing immunology programs or recruiting new faculty, you know, providing opportunities you know, for faculty to um, interact, to try to help them, you know, catalyze new collaborations and relationships, you know, and that's really my role at Cornell right now. I play a role where I try to help uh, bridge programs between the medical college and the Ithaca campus. We're 200 miles apart, yet the um, opportunity to do collaborative synergistic science is enormous. And so finding ways to bring people together. And the Cornell Center for Immunology, it's a similar notion. It's not just bringing people together, but it's bringing disciplines together. Because it's my view that the future of immunology is gonna rely incredibly on computational approaches, engineers, physicists, chemists. And the Cornell campus is just incredibly rich with physical scientists, engineers, um, computational biologists. So the notion of this Cornell Center for Immunology was to really bring those disciplines together uh, to uh, develop a real systems approach uh, that would benefit uh, the engineers, but also benefit the immunologists. So we were developing this, but of course, everybody had um, quite a bit of disruption uh, in 2020. Um, that um, Cornell, like every institution, every place in the country, uh, was facing this enormous challenge um, because of the onset of the pandemic. And again, one of the serendipitous things was that I, I was in Ithaca with this background as a physician, a background as an immunologist. So there aren't that many physician, scientists, immunologists in Ithaca, whereas at medical schools, there are plenty, um, but um, we were trying to come up with an approach uh, to uh, respond to the pandemic. And so I was given the opportunity to play a role in trying to imagine what that approach might be and to uh, work together with others so that we could actually implement a strategy that was based on two absolutely critical principles. Uh, the first was that we wanted to make sure that everything we did um, took public health into consideration, and that was health of individuals on the campus, but also in our community. We're in a small community in um, Ithaca, New York, and we're a large part of that community, and we wanted to make sure that decisions we made uh, would not negatively impact the health of our surrounding community. But the second thing is, is that Cornell University, like other universities, has really important missions. We've got students, we've got investigators who are doing research, um, and we wanted to be able to keep things as normal as possible in the face of the pandemic. And so collectively, we came up with a strategy that involved creating a testing laboratory. We did this in collaboration with our local healthcare um, center. The uh, Cornell University's Ithaca campus has a College of Veterinary Medicine, which is uh, an outstanding uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. The College of Veterinary Medicine had a laboratory, uh, did animal health diagnostics, um, had all of the techniques that one would need to be able to um, uh, study uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, so together with the vet school and the college uh, and the Cayuga Health Systems, which is our local health system, and with our local health department, we created a laboratory uh, that next month will probably have done its two millionth test for COVID. And it was a cornerstone of our approach where we felt that if we could really identify individuals early on with COVID, we could help them um, isolate, we could help them recognize uh, what would be needed to what needed to be done to try to avoid spread. And so by establishing a number of public health guidelines, but also this laboratory, we were actually able to open the campus to residential instruction in the fall of 2020. And the campus has stayed open since then. We've had our ups and downs. Uh, Omicron uh, was difficult for us like it was for lots of other institutions, but I feel like we've been able to put into place a system so that we would be able to respond appropriately to the pandemic, again, following those basic tenets of trying as best as we could to protect public health, but also to have things be as normal as possible. And I'll just say that the effort I, was really successful even beyond our campus. Uh, we did tens of thousands of tests for, uh, for COVID for residents of upstate New York. Um, our laboratory um, helped to identify cases early on for people who are able to then isolate and not infect others. So I do think it was also this community effort that was so important where Cornell you know, was able to use its expertise um, to help um, our colleagues in the community. And again, what a privilege to be able to do that, right? To be able to play a role um, at this time of an emergency, you know, in the country. And it was only because, uh, at least for my part, understanding medicine, understanding basic immunology of the virus um, and being able to apply that knowledge so we could come up with approaches that would put us in the best place we possibly could be. So to kind of continue on this just a little bit before we talk about AAI, I imagine the decision to be open, regardless of any testing parameter, probably met some resistance. And when we think about now with the guidelines of CDC changing, masks becoming optional, you kind of get this camp like, yeah, for the love of God, please let me get rid of my mask. And then a cohort of people that are like, will never take off a mask type of thing. They're very, just very concerned. You know, the pandemic comes, switching it to an understanding as it shifts to a more endemic permanent state. How have you found success in communicating that type of message to people where one day it was locked down, the next day there is no lockdown, but COVID hasn't gone away. Just like you were able to successfully communicate a message to keep things open when the easy option would be to shut things down. Yeah, so boy, Jason, that's such an important question. And it's something that we discuss every day here, right? So that, um, so here are the principles that we used. Uh, the first principle was, is that we would use the science to guide us in decision-making. And that was a message that was given by the president of, un of the university, the provost. Every opportunity, we made sure that we were transparent about what we knew and what we didn't and how the decisions were being made. We also made it absolutely clear that um, we were continuing to learn. And, um, you know, there's all of this public notion that the science has changed. Well, the science hasn't changed. What's changed is our understanding of what's going on. And we, our understanding matured. And with that, we were able to provide guidance or advice um, that uh, was based at least on the foundation of what we knew at the time. And uh, we had multiple town halls, you know, like I'm sure virtually every university had on campus where we met separately with faculty, with students, with staff, with people together, um, particularly when a decision to change what we were doing was being considered. So that decisions weren't made in a vacuum, 
you know, they were made with a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion with the entire leadership of the institution on board, and then a very, very conscious uh, um, uh, communication strategy so individuals understood. And I think we've got credibility. I think that people have bought in to the fact that there are a group of people that are really monitoring what's going on. They're being very thoughtful and they won't make capricious recommendations, um, but they will listen you know, to what the concerns are, what the uh, needs are of the community and try to be responsive. And you're right, Jason, that there are groups of, that keep saying you're doing too much. And there are others that say you do, you're not doing enough, you know, and we just have to walk that line. But the most important thing is to have it be grounded in scientific principles. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more on transparency yeah. and a real, real debate, uh, are, but with, with the real data, not with based on the facts that people like uh, or institutions like universities can provide, I think is, is crucial. Um, moving on to another challenge that you have taken up starting last year, which is the presidency of the American Association of Immunologists. Uh, we would like to talk a little bit about that and about the upcoming uh, large meeting. So why don't you tell us a bit, also thinking of an overseas audience like myself, for example, that might not be completely familiar with what is AAI doing besides just being the Association of Immunologists. Can you tell us about what, what, how, how it has been to direct AAI and what, is, what are the things that makes you most proud of uh, belonging to this association. Yeah, yeah. so I've been a member of AAI now for many, many years. I, I was a trainee member as a student and then have been a member um, uh, since uh, being on the faculty. Um, and um, I've been really lucky. I was elected as a counselor, I guess, uh, five years ago. And this year has been my presidential year. And over this period of time, I've really learned a lot about what AAI does for its members. So, so I'm, I'm be really happy to tell you this. Um, you know, AI's got more than 7,500 members. Uh, something about 65% are regular members. These are, you know, individuals who are accomplished immunologists. Um, they might be in academia. They might be in. Um, uh, industry or working at the NIH or, or some institute, but also a fair number are from abroad, uh, Brenda. So I, I think that um, we, I'd really like folks to know that this is uh, an organization, a society that represents immunologists from around the world. And um, what is it that uh, AAI actually does and what is it that it can provide to its members? And um, so we think about that, at, we as a council, for uh, always. I mean, this is what we focus on as a council. Um, we've had the same uh, director. Our CEO is Michelle Hogan. She's been with AI for 26 years. And she has this amazing institutional memory of the society and has helped as we've been thinking as a council about new programs that we could do, opportunities. And she has been instrumental in making sure we can afford to do these things and then actually implement them. So what are these things? So I think that um, the thing that is a real hallmark for AI are the award programs that we've got for our members. Those include um, many, awards for um, uh, attending the meeting. There are trainee abstract awards. There are travel awards. We actually have a relatively new award program. This one doesn't have money with it. It's our Distinguished Fellows of AI Awards. So these are the most notable uh, immunologists who have been members of the uh, organization. And um, it's really been fun to initiate that. And, and, and to recognize these individuals. But um, for Immunology 2022, the upcoming meeting, 
there are going to be 780 abstract and travel awards to, in particular, help trainees come. But it's not just at the meeting, right? So that there are awards for outstanding postdocs and outstanding students who work in members' laboratories. We've got a new program recognizing the uh, relationship and the importance of understanding computational tools in immunology. So we have a new award which brings immunologists and computational biologists together. We also recognize that there are some people who are active immunologists. They might leave the laboratory for personal reasons for some period of time. We've got a new fellowship program called the Reentry Fellowship Program. So together, all of these awards um, are uh, result in a budget of more than $3 million this year that the society provides for travel to the meeting for these different sorts of awards. So that is something I think is perhaps underappreciated by our members. And this is reinvesting in our membership by helping them um, achieve what the, it is that they most are trying to achieve um, in, a, um, in, in, in their scholarship. Um, of course, we've got the Journal of Immunology. That is um, a journal that is, um, you know, I think uh, for sure, the most highly cited journal in the field. Um, it's been a cornerstone of immunology since it was founded in 1916. And it maintains, you know, the highest standards, of course. We have a new journal, Immuno Horizons, that was launched just a few years ago and is really taking off. So the notion is, is that the society, AAI, becomes a vehicle so people can uh, present their work, can showcase the best of their science. Um, over the years, AI has developed some courses. We've got two courses which um, have become incredibly popular. They're both in the summer. There's a basic immunology course and then an advanced immunology course. Uh, their advanced immunology course is going to be in June this year, the basic immunology course in July. Uh, the advanced immunology will be in Boston in person and the uh, basic immunology course in person in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, the feedback has been outstanding for these courses that we um, always uh, modify them. We respond uh, to the uh, to the evaluations from the students. Um, and um, we're really, really happy to be able to do that in person this year. Last year, of course, it was uh, remote. And then I'll just mention two other things that AAI does. One is that we are advocates for research. Uh, the council and the uh, public affairs committee uh, meets with congressmen um, and their staff about funding for the NIH. When there are issues that come up, we make statements. Um, and it's not restricted just to science, that we've made a statement recently about the tragedy in the Ukraine, so that we want to be a voice. And then the last thing that we're doing, or the most recent thing that we're doing, is a new initiative that we're just starting. And this really comes from the fact that over the years, um, immunology has become much, much more visible to the public. Um, I think a big step in this was around cancer immunotherapy a few years ago, right? Um, where in the New York Times or other uh, lay press, uh, um, um, you would read stories about the amazing um, new advances, you know, that have come because of our understanding of fundamental immunology. Certainly with COVID, that's become the case. I think most people in the world, or at least in many parts of the world now think of themselves as immunologists, right? They read uh, phrases in the lay press that we only used to read in the Janeway or Bill Paul textbook. And um, the uh, American Association of Immunologists has taken on this notion that it's actually our responsibility as a society that represents immunology to try to demystify uh, immunology to the public. We especially want to try to mitigate 
the misinformation that people are hearing, that one of the tragedies, I think, um, of our current time is that science is misrepresented, that evidence is not used for making decisions. And we think one contribution that we can make is by becoming a little bit more public facing, by providing information so that um, people can hear facts that are not partisan about vaccination or about fundamental biology or about how immunology really impacts medicine and, and, and the public. Um, so this is a new in initiative that we're just beginning. So to kind of follow up here as, as, we, and as we wrap up, you know, you got a meeting coming up in person in Portland, which is my hometown, which makes it extra awesome. How was it setting up one of the first post-pandemic meetings that hasn't been canceled? Yeah, so we're now, uh, I guess it starts May 6th, so we're getting closer and closer. I actually just bought my plane ticket today, so I'm very sure we're going to be able to do this. Um, again, we're doing it in an evidence-based way. Uh, there will be, there is a vaccine requirement. So if you would like to come to the meeting, and I hope you'll both be there. I'd love to meet you in your hometown, uh, Jason. Um, it would be required that you be vaccinated. Um, you know, meetings often have um, advanced registration, which we have, um, and then on-site registration. Well, this year on-site will be online from your hotel room, because again, you're gonna have to demonstrate your vaccination. So we're not gonna have a booth where people can come to the meeting without having registered. But aside from that, we hope that it'll be very, very normal, right? That um, the meeting will um, bring together thousands of people, we hope in a very safe way uh, with this vaccination requirement. Right now we're still, um, right now the plan is for people to still be masked indoors. Um, but we're, you know, watching the science again, you know, as, as, um, as uh, you know, things continue to unfold. But the meeting is going to have all of the hallmarks of an outstanding scientific Congress, right? There's going to be um, uh, a distinguished lecture series, just like each year. We'll have three distinguished lecturers. We'll have... Um, major symposia each morning, uh, Saturday through Tuesday. So there'll be eight major symposia from a range of topics. There'll be our award lectures that we uh, bestow uh, career awards uh, to some of the most um, prominent immunologists. And so far they're all able to come, right? So that we're going to be able to bring people together. But most importantly, this is a time for trainees. This is a time for trainees to present their work. This is a time for them to network, for them to get to meet people, not as little squares on a Zoom screen, but in real life, so that they can begin to understand you know, the process, that they can be inspired by others, they can get questions answered, they begin to really become part of the next generation of immunologists. And, I think that this meeting is an amazing way for people to do that. There are social events, you know, that happen. There are a lot of science, but I think one of the most exciting parts of the meeting are the poster sessions where people congregate and talk about discoveries that are made by our students, by our postdocs, by our junior faculty, junior investigators, where they really have the opportunity, I think, to interact. And of course, you know, we've got guest societies that will be there. We've got other programming, but this will be a full-fledged meeting uh, and really in made many ways a celebration of being able to be back together again. Nice. So exciting. I'm looking at the, at the lineup of speakers and it's all-star lineup. I see a couple of, if, if I may just uh, say a couple of, uh, uh, former guests in our show also presenting so friends of the show and uh it's clearly going to be a very exciting meeting and a great opportunity as you say for trainees to get their science out 
you know, catch up with their networking and be inspired by everyone because I think that it's so important uh, to to be there physically present, to see people talking about their work, to meet all the big minds. And we will also be having in our upcoming uh, episodes a couple of Uh, lecturers will also be talking to us in the show so we're very happy to really keep an eye on on AI's uh, meeting this year and uh, I think that with this uh, it's such an interesting such an interesting conversation that we had I think I think we have to start wrapping up otherwise we would be talking about this for for a really long time it's very nice uh, but before we let you go we like to ask a little bit of tension question Um, and I think my favorite question to ask, and we've got so many really nice answers in the past, uh, is to ask you if you, you are clearly a man of science, but if you were not a scientist, what do you think you would be? Boy, that's, that's a great question. It's, it's hard to step away from what I do for a living, but I, I think if I was, wasn't a scientist, if that wasn't the direction I would have gone, I actually think I would have wanted to have been a historian. And, and I'll tell you why. And, and um, it, it is just so intriguing to understand history. It is so important, I think, you know, especially in times of turmoil. And unfortunately, we're in times of turmoil right now to try to understand how we got there, try to understand the antecedents, try to understand well enough so that someday we could perhaps avoid getting ourselves into so much trouble, you know, and that's right now looking at the world. I mean, what, what, what could we have learned from former pandemics that might have helped us avoid some of the missteps that happened with COVID? Uh, When one looks at you know conflict in the world, are there ways that you can really understand how that happens so that you can put into place things that will prevent it? You know, people are people. You know, it's really hard to um, force social evolution, but maybe understanding ourselves better would have a huge impact in trying to prevent future problems. To go with that, like this the understanding of how humans calculate risk and emphasize new risk versus existing risk, and then that behavior that we are all hardwired from, you know, millions of years of evolution really affects how we interact yeah. with yeah. the world, including during a pandemic. Right. And it's all connected, right? History and science. I mean, they are connected. Everything is connected to history because everything is history, a way or another. Everything is related to us. Oh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us today and for you know, uh, sharing with us your work at AAI uh, in the in the uh, wake of the upcoming meeting. And well, we wish you the you have a great time in, in Portland. Uh, have a safe trip and we'll be keeping, we'll be uh, continuing our reporting on the meeting later on. Great. Well, well thank you both very much. And I hope I'll see you in Portland. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com if you have any feedback or if you want to suggest a guest. So, well, see you next time. <laughs>